Hello and welcome to Baiju's IAS. It has been our endeavor at Baiju's to help and support IAS aspirants at every stage of their preparation. Now, when IAS mains examination 2021 is over and aspirants are gearing up for the last leg of this prestigious examination that is personality test, we are back again to assist them forming an insight and opinion about multiple issues and topics concerning our great nation and its body polity. Like last year, we have meticulously curated a special series of talks and lectures to help our would-be steel pillars of nation in their personality test. In this special series of talk, we invite the stalwarts of our nation, renowned personalities, eminent civil servants, public policy experts, academicians, intellectuals, to address the young aspirants of UPSC civil services examination and guide them by sharing their views on significant topics chosen carefully from various spheres of knowledge such as Indian economy, India's foreign policy, public policy, our judicial system, our election system, etc. etc. When we started this program last year, we received overwhelming response from students in general and those preparing for their personality test in particular. This series will help you to get ready and give finishing touches for the final stage of your preparation and provide you with pragmatic insights to maximize your score. In this series, today we are joined by a very distinguished legendary civil servant, retired IS officer and former Chief Election Commissioner of India, Dr. S. Y. Qureshi sir. Sir. Sir has PhD in communications and social marketing as well. And the kind of electoral reforms Sir introduced that are still recognized and that actually maintained the sanctity of the electoral process of the largest democracy of this of this world. Welcome to Baiju's IS, sir. Thank you. We are really honored and privileged to have you in our series. Sir, first is, let us start with elections that just concluded in five states. We saw that various political parties, different stakeholders of the election, they, they released their manifesto, they promised different things, freebies, etc., etc. But sir, our past record shows that there is no accountability on the part of implementing the promises these political parties are making in their manifesto. So what is the legality of such manifesto? Can it be enforced or what should be done to make those promises implementable or executable? Actually, it's a very important question which has been asked. Uh, it even went up to the Supreme Court. So somebody uh, went in PIL and wanted uh, manifestos to be uh, banned. And um, uh, uh, because you make promises that it will uh, amount to bribing of the voters. So the, um, uh, I think Supreme Court was also puzzled because uh, they said we, it is not a corrupt practice. We cannot call it a corrupt practice. However, it is undesirable. Now, if it is undesirable, what can you do? And if it is not a corrupt practice, it is legal and valid. So they asked the Election Commission of India to call all the political parties and discuss with them uh, the, what can be done about it and uh, uh, if necessary uh, uh, frame guidelines uh, uh, to which uh, uh, these manifestos should conform. Now the election commission uh, had to go through this formality because it was an order of the Supreme Court but they did it very uh, half-heartedly as one could see because 
uh, actually it is impossible to interfere uh, with the manifesto because it's a legitimately legal document. Now, a political party has to make promises to its voters. How else will it do it? So they do it through the manifesto. So uh, election commission went through the ritual. They called all political party uh, parties and they all pound on the election commission. This is how dare you interfere? This is our legal right, our duty to inform the voters what we are going to do for them. So, but then uh, election commission said, you know, no, but then you should make responsible statements. And they framed uh, guidelines which are which is more of a formality, I'm sure. I personally feel that uh, neither the Supreme Court nor the Election Commission should interfere in the, the manifesto process. Now, the other issue of the, the irresponsible promises. Right. Surely there will be irresponsible promises, but what are the what is the voters' uh, role in it? Um, if uh, we should be able to see that the promises are um, uh, unrealistic, and in any case, after five years, when you are evaluating them again on the basis of last five years' performance, voters uh, are not so fully that they do not uh, they would not remember that these are the promises you made then. And for instance, job. Right. Everybody talks about job, right. one of the failures of the, the BJP, they say that they could not provide the job. Mm -hmm. Which means everybody remembered the promise. Mm -hmm. So it is for the voters to remember the promise. And it is for the media to keep reminding the voters that these are the promises which were made and they should evaluate and they should come up uh, with their own analysis that these were the promises made and these are the ones uh, which are still unfulfilled. And what is the role of the opposition? They should be doing their job. You know, people say election commission should do it. What can election commission do? How can you election commission sit in judgment whether um, a promise has been fulfilled or not? Right. Election commission has to do a very important job, um, the biggest management event of the world, which is India's election. So therefore, for them to get bogged down with the analysis whether the manifestos were realistic and whether they, they have lived up to the promises, it's not possible. The political parties, the opposition, the media and the voters themselves. Right. And I think uh, voters are not stupid. The fact that uh, many governments are coming back, right. which means uh, 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 breaking uh, anti-incumbency, which means voters are rewarding performance. If they feel happy with the performance, they bring you back. Right. If not, they, they throw you out right. earlier. Uh, almost ritually every five years the government used to go. Right. Now the governments are being brought back a second time and a third time because people are happy with the performance of a party. Mm -hmm. So uh, that is how I feel. So means uh, media, voter and opposition political parties, right. they have larger role. Exactly. Right. Exactly. And uh, secondly, it cannot be declared illegal because if it could be, Supreme Court would have made it illegal. Right. They themselves say, you know, it is not a corrupt practice. So. Just be responsible, right. whatever that means. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Sir, now, again, staying back to this, these elections of uh, uh, five states, we saw lower voter turnout. Uh, several efforts have been made by election commission also, political parties also. What is lagging or what is missing that prevents voters to come out of their home and go to the... Uh, voting polling booth because if voters are not coming out you cannot call it real democracy so how to increase voter turnout and what are the implications of low voter turnout mm, yeah the low voter turnout uh, actually the voter turnout is different in different parts of the country UP traditionally had low turnout mm -hmm. but northeastern states have very high turnout so you would have noticed that in Manipur and in Goa the turnout was 80% and above, which has been the, the norm. Now, UP, the, actually for the last three, four elections, the turnout had been dramatically increasing. Okay. And I'm uh, surprised that this time, uh, instead of increasing uh, further, uh, it has been uh, a couple of uh, percentage points uh, lower. Yes. So, now what could be the reason? Once, uh, when the voters are... Uh, not happy with the performance uh, of the incumbent government. So they uh, feel disillusioned and they get, get disinterested. Mm -hmm. Whereas <coughs> their core voter, the committed voter will come out, uh, whether you know, uh, uh, in rain, storm or whatever, they will surely come. 
So uh, this lack of enthusiasm could be anti-incumbency. Mm -hmm. At the same time, uh, it's very difficult to pinpoint that because it can also mean lack of enthusiasm for the opposition party and its promises. Mm -hmm. So, but it is uh, something worth taking note of right. that the UP voter, which had been increasing uh, by every every election, yes, sir. this time has uh, shown disinterest. Right. Great. Sir. So, again, you were talking about UP or um, if we extrapolate your argument in northern India and in, in, in entire India only, this criminalization of politics has been a big issue. And while you were the chief election commissioner, you took so many measures to discourage that and to prevent that. But on larger uh, perspective, if a student goes for the personality test, criminalization of politics and politicization of criminals. So it is actually threatening the very survival of our democratic setup. How to deal with that, sir, and what ref uh, reforms are required? It's uh, one issue which has been uh, agitating our minds uh, in the Election Commission and uh, many other thinkers uh, and politicians um, because we see that the number of people with criminal uh, cases pending against them, uh, their numbers are increasing right. in Parliament and Vidhan Sabha. Mm -hmm. In today's Parliament, 43% uh, of MPs have criminal cases pending against them. Mm -hmm. by their own affidavit which they gave at the time of uh, filing their nomination. Right. Now, 43 percent, it was uh, in 2004, it was just about 24 percent. Then it increased, uh, every election it has increased from 124, 121, 46, 183, and now 233 MPs mm -hmm. have these cases. It's a shame, it's a disgrace. Right. And it, let me tell you, we go worldwide uh, giving lectures and when people ask us this question, we feel very embarrassed. We can't uh, answer it. Now, um, we, but we get, uh, many people blame the election commission. The election commission is toothless, is spineless, they cannot keep the criminals out. They don't understand that we cannot debar anybody from contesting election. Mm -hmm. The eligibility is decided by uh, the parliament. Right. So we have been demanding that the act should be amended and people against whom serious cases are pending they should be debarred from contesting. Mm -hmm. The politicians respond that um, the law of the land is that uh, you are uh, innocent, uh, you are presumed innocent till proved guilty, right. till convicted. Right. Uh, I think it's a very, very fair point, very valid point. But in response, the election commission has provided three safeguards. One, not every case will make you ineligible to contest. Mm -hmm. Only serious cases. For instance, suppose you violated traffic. Mm -hmm. That is a criminal offense also, mm -hmm. but not serious enough to, to debar you from contesting. So, you abuse somebody, you slap somebody, these are a small thing. But heinous offenses like rape, decoity, murder, kidnapping, corruption, now, at least these cases. So, Election Commission's formulation is that only heinous offenses which carry imprisonment of five years or more. Mm -hmm. uh, if the, uh, you are guilty of them or if you have committed them, if you are charged of these offenses, you should be debarred from contesting. Mm -hmm. Secondly, they say that politically uh, false cases are registered against each other. Our response is that uh, the case should have been registered at least one year uh, before uh, the election. So right. you have one year to sort it out. And third and more impo most important, that the court of law should have framed the charges against you. Right. Now, a police FIR can be a false FIR. Police can take action, motivated action, or uh, uh, would not take any action uh, for reasons of politics. But a court of law is independent. And which court we are we talking about? We are talking of a session court because if it is a five years imprisonment, it can only be tried in a session court. That is the senior most court after the High Court. Right. So if they have framed the charges, then only you will be disqualified. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, and this has been going on for 30 years, but uh, no solution. I have asked a counter question in various fora where judges were present and uh, jurists and uh, constitutional experts were present, uh, which nobody has answered till today. And I'll repeat that question to you also. In Indian jails today, there are 4,30,000 prisoners of which 70,000 are 
under trial. <laughs> that means not yet convicted. Check. That means they are innocent mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. because there is presumption of innocence. Now, despite that, you have taken away four of their fundamental rights. Right to liberty, freedom of movement, freedom of occupation, right to dignity. Three, four um, the fundamental rights are taken away of innocent people, 2,70,000 innocent people within the ambit of law. You're, you're not doing it illegally. Within the ambit of law, you are... Uh, and uh, besides that, you are, uh, even the right to vote is taken away. Correct. Now, a criminal in jail can contest from there, but an under trial in jail cannot uh, even vote. Now, this is a to total injustice. Mm -hmm. In fact, I wrote an article uh, a few months ago and uh, pointing this out, and my last sentence was, hey, Your Lordship, appeal to the Supreme Court, please take it as my PIL and release them outright because uh, already they've been in jail for months and years and they're still innocent. And so now right to contest is not even a fundamental right. right. So if that is suspended for some time, I think it will be uh, quite fair. Right. So, but we must do something about it. Otherwise, uh, our democracy is getting a bad name. And we are sleeping in um, the global index of democracy. Yes. Uh, among <coughs> the various reasons, this is one of them. Yes. Great. And sir, there has been talks with regards to one nation, one election. And uh, we saw that coming from top. Uh, Prime Minister also advocated for that. We have so many articles on that. But being an authority on election, uh, could you please uh, um, 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 uh, share your views or enlighten us as a student who are watching this video? the feasibility, the pros and cons of one nation, one election. Hmm. You know, they, this uh, issue has been uh, uh, in the air for uh, since 2013. Uh, it was there in BJP manifesto. And when Prime, uh, Mr. Modi, before becoming Prime Minister, he was addressing BJP workers, he uh, demanded, he suggested that the, 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 let there be a national debate on one nation, one election. And he said that all three tiers of democracy, panchayats, uh, vidhan sabha, and parliament, all three uh, should be held together. Uh, because uh, mainly for two reasons. One, number one, uh, election is very costly and repeatedly we are, we are incurring that cost. And secondly, the normal working of the government and administration is disrupted. Because after all, the ministers, the uh, uh, IS officers, IPS officers, the district magistrate, SP, and um, the hierarchy down the line, they get uh, busy in the election at the cost of all of the work. So, um, very valid argument. Um, but it is not easy, um, uh, constitutionally or legally, although, that, as you said, what are the pros and cons? Now, the pros are that it, it makes sense that you, uh, voter is the same, polling station is the same, the machinery which conducts either our elections or Punjab election is the same, the district administration. Security apparatus is the same. So the voter goes there, instead of pressing just one machine at a, in one election, he presses all three machines and all three elections are taken care of. It happens in U.S. there are 20 elections in a day. 20 machines, if there are machines, 20 machines are pressed. So it makes sense. It also will bring down the cost, no doubt. But then, you know, it uh, militates against federal principles. Now, in order to achieve a, a one nation, one election, you will have to coincide uh, the poll of all the state. Mm -hmm. Now, the Constitution provides a fixed five-year term to every house. Now, the, whenever you decide to do a simultaneous election, you will have to curtail uh, some uh, uh, Vidhan Sabha uh, duration and increase uh, another so that you have it all at the same time, which is constitutionally uh, not allowed. Um, secondly, the reason why originally there used to be simultaneous polls, hmm. but hmm. why was the cycle disturbed? Because some government fell prematurely. Mm -hmm. So government can fall prematurely even now. Right. Suppose we have created a situation that, uh, yes, we have uh, uh, achieved simultaneous election. Vidhan, Lok Sabha and all Vidhan Sabhas go to poll together. 
Lok Sabha falls in six months, as it happened in the case of Mr. Vajpayee. Right. Now, what happens for a 229 state which have uh, which have come with absolute majorities, which are doing fine? Why should they be disturbed? Because one party uh, left the coalition, or uh, some MPs uh, changed side for whatever reason. So, because of that, uh, the entire country. Why should they be disturbed? Conversely, one state, uh, is a government loses majority. What? Why should 28 other states uh, suffer also? Right. So, thirdly, the, I had heard a very interesting question: that uh, what do people want? People love a repeated election. So, and their uh, what they, their desire is more important. Why do they love election? Because for most people, this is the only power they have: the power to vote. How many times have we heard an MP or an MLA does not go back to the constituency after winning the election? We have seen even posters being uh, posted on the wall, uh, missing, <laughs> MP is missing, dundosko. So, why, why, you know, the, 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 that is the kind of thing which we hear all the time. Now, because of repeated election, at this MP and MLA have to keep going back to the people. So, the accountability increases. So, people love it. Then I had heard uh, in a youth parliament in Pune, one uh, girl from Chhattisgarh came out with a very interesting slogan. Because, uh, um, uh, in the context of uh, economy, the economy it uh, generates. It says, "Jab jab chunao aata hai, garib ke peet mein pulao aata hai." You know, now uh, estimate was that in the last general election, sixty thousand crore rupees were spent. Now, this 60,000 actually is the money of the politician which is being recycled. Transporter, printer, poster guy, slogan wala, worker, they all get some money. So, actually, it was for the economy. Now, finally, I would say that since the Prime Minister did not, if he wanted, he had absolute majority, he would have thrust it down the throat of the nation. Mm -hmm. He has not. He only wanted a national debate which is going on because it is not uh, easy to achieve it. But the reason why he said it, can, we, can this be achieved uh, by an alternative route? I would like to suggest that. He said, a mm, uh, lot of money, 60,000 crores is spent. All right, so there is a cap on uh, expenditure by a candidate. For instance, in parliament it used to be 70 lakhs and now about 10% more. So, but then, there is no cap or limit on political parties' expenditure. Right. Now, you, are, uh, you spend 70 lakhs uh, of your own, uh, uh, but your party spends 7 crores on you. That disturbs like level playing field. So, let, the, let us put an expenditure ceiling that uh, candidate will spend 70 lakhs, party will spend 70 lakhs. Immediately from 50,000 crores, it will come down to 5,000 crores. Think of that. Secondly, all three elections, earlier we, they were talking of all three elections. Now we, they have stopped talking of Pachayat election. And then uh, Niti Aayog also said, okay, okay, once in five years, if it is not possible, let there be election uh, twice in five years. So which means half of uh, the Lok Sabha um, uh, or uh, Vidhan Sabha should uh, go to poll at one time, the other half. Now, if you have compromised so much, 30 lakh uh, the seats of panchayat you, you have removed, so where is the sanctity of a simultaneous election? Either it should be all three together, mm -hmm. because that is the logic, and it should be all uh, once in five years, uh, not uh, twice in five years. So it has been diluted and compromised because of its impr impracticality. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think uh, this chapter should close as early as possible. Right. Means practically it is not feasible actually. It's not feasible. Right, so it's right. not feasible. Sir, when we go to vote, we have an option of nota, none of the above. And um, um, uh, we have seen that at times, total nota vote cast is more than the elected candidate gets. Mm. But since nota votes are not counted, then what is the uh, um, uh, significance of nota? Don't you think, sir, it is? it should have been made some... It, it should have been given some power or something like that. Or we, you can co connect this with right to recall, right to reject types. So, what is the effectivity of NOTA? Well, yeah, that's a very good question because it does sound uh, like a contradiction. 
uh, election commission uh, for instance for 20 years has been in working in support of nota at the same time election commission has been opposing the right to reject mm -hmm. so nota has not created right to reject so otherwise what, uh, people expect that if the number of nota votes is higher than the, the uh, highest candidate uh, so nota is the winner there should be and nota is not a person therefore there should be another election right sir. and all those who contested should be debarred from the next election mm -hmm. so legally mm, uh, it will not be sustainable according to me because uh, why is it that people are demanding nota because of the criminal candidates mm -hmm. So uh, the top two, three parties are criminal candidate, but suppose there is a gentleman candidate also, a professor or a uh, ordinary person with no uh, previous uh, negative background, why should he be debarred uh, for no fault of his? Mm -hmm. Because of the four or five criminal candidates, uh, you know, you debar all of them, legally it will be, uh, it, it will work against your fundamental right to contest. Right. So, uh, the, therefore, it's not sustainable. Then why is it that election commission was demanding it? Mm -hmm. For two totally different reasons. Basically, to guard against the secrecy. So, uh, because otherwise what uh, happened was that uh, in the ballot paper days, you could go there, take the ballot paper, put a stamp in three, four places to spoil the ballot, fold it and put it uh, into the box and... Uh, if come back and say, well, I voted uh, for X or Y or whosoever uh, wants to, uh, who is pursuing you. But actually, what you have passed is an invalid vote. Mm -hmm. Many of them will just, uh, instead of putting any time blank vote, they will, ballot paper, they will fold. And some uh, used to even write sub chore and yes. fold yes. Yes. But they were all invalid votes mm -hmm. <coughs> in the paper ballot days. Now you cannot do that drama, that you blank vote because you go there, you pretend you're voting and you come out because when you press a button, hmm. there is a loud beep, right? loud enough to be heard in the entire room or maybe even outside. So sometimes, you know, if you have forgotten and if you try to do that, everybody hears uh, no beep and they say, so um, you cannot uh, do that kind of a drama. Now, NOTA has created that possibility that you press a button as if you are voting. And why was it required? to For your protection. Otherwise, and this is the word Supreme Court has used in the NOTA judgment, that if, uh, suppose, some uh, criminal uh, or a strong man candidate of your neighborhood, he lost by 100 votes or 200 votes. So he will pick out everybody who has not voted. He'll come to Mawla, tune vote nidia, tune vote nidia, tune nidia, maata hai. So uh, against the reprisal, Supreme Court has mentioned it in the judgment to, to guard people against this kind of a reprisal. So uh, this drama is created that you go and you pretend you are voting. And thirdly, the Supreme Court said that after all, voting is an important uh, right uh, which you have. And it's a holiday, it's a official holiday. Right. At least take the trouble of going there and join the festival of democracy. Even if you are indifferent or you, uh, if you want to express no opinion, at least go there. So that is the logic of uh, NOTA. Now, purpose is that they, it will uh, uh, put moral pressure on political parties to put up good candidates. Mm -hmm. In fact, uh, I was against the right to reject. You mentioned right to reject. I was against right to reject when I wrote my book uh, called uh, An Undocumented Wonder, The Making of the Great Indian Election. I discussed all the possible systems and there I mentioned NOTA, uh, mentioned uh, there is a first part of the post system, proportional representation and about right to reject, right to record. I oppose the right to reject because that will mean repeated elections. Mm -hmm. And repeated elections, uh, it is easy for us to say well, let there be a second election, third election, but who conducts the election? Our uh, sisters and mothers and uh, uh, daughters-in-law who are school teachers, they go the, to conduct election. Right. Our polling parties and the uh, elections are not conducted in just the Connaught place of Delhi, but in the Chhattisgarh, in Jharkhand, in Manipur, in Nagaland, in Kashmir, very difficult areas where even the security forces require security. There to say, you know, let us have another election in three months or four months. 
So ask the teachers, ask your sisters, would, would they like repeated elections? They will not. So they go to, uh, for election duty because it is le uh, legal uh, requirement. If somebody doesn't uh, go for election duty, there is imprisonment. So who can afford to do that? So therefore, repeat election is not a good idea. So when I wrote that, um, uh, Mr. Anna Hazare came to uh, see me, along with his uh, 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 famous colleague. And he said uh, that your opposition to right to, uh, we understand your concern, but let me assure you that there will not be too many repeated elections because of that. Because you, there will be some. But once, uh, you know, people who have spent 10 crores or 20 crores and uh, through nota and uh, uh, they have been uh, rejected, so that right to reject, uh, if it is converted to right to reject, it will ensure that they will not put up such candidates again because uh, these candidates will be defeated by the people. He says, you guys, uh, election commission, you have been demanding it and you have failed uh, to debar a criminal candidate, but this right to reject will uh, enforce um, uh, this uh, and it will force political parties and not to put up such candidates. I think he had a point, and in my subsequent edition of the book, I mentioned uh, this, and I think this is uh, a good point to discuss, and let us see uh, how it uh, can work. Right. But right to recall is a bad idea. Mm -hmm. Very difficult, you know, otherwise it will lead to instability. Now, imagine in Kashmir, we, uh, with what great difficulty we conduct elections there. Manipur, uh, uh, Nagaland, even Assam, for instance, uh, Bengal, Bihar. Uh, so, um, uh, uh, Suppose in parliament you got 5 lakh votes, I got 4 lakh 90 thousand votes. So 5 lakh people have voted for you. So how many people will demand your uh, overthrow, that you should be thrown out, uh, that you should be recalled? 5,000? 10,000? Right. Now how can 10,000 people demand the removal of an MP who has been elected by 5 lakh voters? Right. You know, so that is, that is uh, totally ridiculous. Ridiculous, yes. Thank you, sir. Sir, now you talked about uh, the misuse of ballot paper. And nowadays we are also seeing or um, some whispering or some, some, some discussion with regards to uh, tempering of electronic voting machines, EVMs. And uh, some critics have said that, you know, we should go back to postal ballot system. Sorry, not postal, ballot system. Ballot. So, sir, is it a good idea or we should continue with EVMs because in America also we see ballot system, but they are not using uh, voting machines. No, certainly we should continue with the uh, EVMs um, and of course we can uh, introduce some correct, corrective measures, some safeguard. But uh, why? Because we have been doing it for uh, so many years and uh, it has worked very well. Uh, now people have been uh, have been asking me this question uh, indefinitely. So I think after the West Bengal election, what is it that the BJP government did not do to win that election? Mm -hmm. For four months, their entire cabinet was camping there. They spent thousands and thousands of crores there. So if the EVM was uh, possible to manipulate, do you think they would have spared that? The fact that despite all the effort, uh, BJP was defeated, which shows that EVMs are uh, defendable. Now, every single party in the country at some point or the other has opposed the EVM, including the BJP, mind you. In 2009, they even published a book, Democracy in Danger, with a foreword by Mr. L.K. Advani, uh, written by uh, the, uh, what is his name, uh, Narsimha Rao. Uh, Cephalogist. Cephalogist. Mm -hmm. So he, he wrote that book and uh, Congress has opposed it, everybody has opposed it at some time or the other, but the fact that the governments are getting defeated, now otherwise if it was manipulatable, no government will ever lose an election. Right. Right. Now they are losing election all the time. So, and thirdly, you know, when it was the, the opposition to um, the EVM was at its peak in 2009 and 10, when I became the CEC, immediately I called a meeting of all political parties. And I asked them, what is your concern? They all said they want to return to the ballot paper because machine can be manipulated. 
uh, it was being led by Mr. Chandra Babu Naidu. And all others were only, you know, in a crowd, you, you just follow. We asked other chief ministers and others, what is your complaint? Jo Chandra Babu Naidu ji ki ji, jo kehra hai, bas wohi humari bhi. Amni Chandra Babu ji se pucha ke saab, what is your... He says ke, uh, there is no transparency. When we press a button, uh, it is going into the machine. Where is it going? We, uh, we uh, do not know. So, if you introduce VV PAT, Voter verifiable paper audit trail, then machines will be fine. So believe me, in the same meeting we took the decision. All right, we will issue, we will uh, introduce VVPAT. We are the two factories which uh, make these machines, BEL and ECIL, in uh, Bangalore and Hyderabad, to de start developing the machine. Within a year, the machines were developed. They were tried in five cities, uh, in different climatic uh, regions. They worked very well. And since then, we have been using them. Now, the last issue, which is still hanging fire, is how many, of the, after all, this is paper audit. And it, so how many of the machines should be counted through the ballot, uh, that chit which is generated? Now, what is VVPAT? When you press the button, it will go into uh, the electronic machine, and you cannot see. But parallelly, there is a printer. And there is a screen on which the person you have selected, he appears. His, his name or her name will appear with a symbol for seven seconds, which is enough for your mind to register. And after that, it gets cut automatically and goes into a sealed box. Now, if machine record 540 uh, people having voted, there will be 540 slips also, 540 chits. Uh, so we can uh, uh, corroborate with each other by counting the slips. So how many slips have to be counted? Initial election commission said that in every the Vidhan Sabha constituency, which is about 300 polling booths, one machine will be the, uh, counted uh, with the, the, through its chits. Mm -hmm. slip. Now it <coughs> went up to Supreme Court and Supreme Court says one is too little, let it be five. Now, Five or ten years, all these are arbitrary, but in any case, five is more than one, so it should satisfy. Now, when we find that uh, these five uh, exactly tally with the machine, we show that the machines are working fine. I, am, uh, I have a uh, drastic view on the subject. I say let us count 100% slips, because you know the demand for return to ballot papers is not acceptable to me. It will be a very backward step. So let us count the slips. And the slips do not take very long to count because it is just uh, the side of a size of a um, your visiting card. Right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Unlike a ballot paper which was the size of a right. newspaper, mm -hmm. that in that ballot paper, 40, 50, 60 candidates, you will search whatever you would, uh, who you voted for and then put it in the right tray. Here, this is it's just a small slip. Counting it is very easy. I have even gone to the extent of saying, let us only count the slips and uh, count the machine only as a sample, five or ten machines to be counted, to save time, if you want to save time. And it takes almost the same time, 20 minutes to 25 minutes. Uh, uh, when we show you the result from the electronic machine, it takes about 20 minutes. And when you count the slips from one electronic machine, it also takes 20 minutes. So you, you do the counting here and use uh, the machine only to cross-check, not the other way around. Try this, because anything uh, um, uh, is uh, worth it if you, uh, to avoid going back to the ballot paper. Okay. Now, one thing I will finish on that, when you say, and lots of people say that even America doesn't use it. Now, even America actually is a wrong example to give, because America is totally decentralized. There are 10,000, actually literally 10,000 uh, municipal and uh, counties and other, and everyone has a different system. There are hundreds of them which use machines, and different kinds of machines, uh, and hundreds of them which do not use any machine. So therefore, America uh, uses EVM and also doesn't use EVM, so it's not easy to generalize, it's not possible. So there is no uniformity yeah. there. And yes, sir, yes. Sir. And also, let me tell you, to say that even America doesn't use, I don't like to hear that because we don't have to learn everything from America. America has not given us a woman president in 250 years. 
Whereas within 19 years, we gave a woman prime minister and a powerful one as that, Indira Gandhi. So who is better? America took 144 years to give equal voting rights to women. 144 years. We, the poor country, gave the equal voting rights on day one, on 26 January 1950. So who is superior? Who has to learn from whom? So therefore, I don't buy this argument that since they are not using, we should also not use. Let them learn from us. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Now, sir, last question is with regards to uh, discussion on voting rights to Indian diaspora NRIs. So, um, is it a good idea or its time has come? Actually, that's a difficult question to answer because uh, on at one level, every citizen of India must have a right to vote. But at the same time, there is uh, Article 14 which gives equality. Mm -hmm. Now, you can't have double standards. In a, for domestic voters, you have some norm, and for uh, uh, foreign voters, uh, they say that electronic voting should be, uh, uh, internet voting should be allowed. Mm -hmm. Now, how can you allow uh, internet voting to a section of voters just because they're abroad? Secondly, you know, the model code of conduct is observed very strictly, enforced strictly. Mm -hmm. Even a cup of tea cannot be given to a voter. And we keep saying that the, the way the liquor is distributed, money is distributed, and the election commission comes down heavily on these domestic voters. But what is happening in London, Kuwait, uh, Paris, and New York, uh, parties uh, where liquor is flowing, chicken flying, so how would you check the model code violations and all kinds of uh, activities happening? So we can't have double standards. Secondly, if you come from Patna to Delhi, uh, you have another rule. But if you go from uh, Patna to uh, London, then you are a VIP. You can even do internet voting. Uh, no law applies to you. That's wrong. So if internet voting is being considered for uh, the uh, voters, reason, it has to be done even for domestic migrants. Right. Because you can't distinguish between domestic migrant and a foreign uh, migrant to another country. Mm -hmm. So that's why the, at the moment you are, you are entitled to vote provided you are coming back to the place where you are registered. What is shown as a permanent address in your passport. And you have to physically come and vote. So obviously Kerala uh, not being far from Dubai, so uh, lots of people come. But in Punjab, hardly anybody ever comes to uh, to vote. So that is a limitation, and uh, some via media has to be found. Right. Thank you, sir. Thank you so very much. Thank you. This candid conversation with former Chief Election Commissioner Dr. S. Y. Kuraisi, sir. An authority on elections, polity, governance must have dispelled lots of myths, rumors and inculcated a sense of confidence among IAS aspirants while they approach their personality test. Thank you so very much, sir. Thank you. Thank you very much.